Hi guys, <laughs> Dr. Ken Dornberg with you. I've been uh, taking a little time off here lately, but I'm actually getting back and start putting on my little fireplace seminars, and pretty soon we'll start, you'll start seeing some in the woods, in my study hunting area up near the Canadian border. I'm really anxious to get up there. Uh, this morning, I just finished writing an article a uh, magazine article for September. You know, kind of a peculiar thing about being an outdoor writer. <laughs> I've been doing this for 40 years, but we always have to be thinking, you know, when I, I only write about deer hunting, I always have to be thinking two months ahead, you know. But when you get down to it, that's not long <laughs> before we'll actually be deer hunting. At least if you're a bull hunter, you're actually going to be deer hunting in a couple of months from now. Today, you will. That's, that's coming up pretty quick. <laughs> that's kind of exciting. You know, I think and write about deer hunting year round. And, uh, but even because, despite that, I'm starting to get kind of excited about getting up to deer hunting. Last night, I fell asleep thinking I was laying in deer camp. I love being in deer camp. Oh, what a pleasant thought to have in my mind when I'm falling asleep. So it's coming up pretty quick. Before you know it, it'll be here. So anyway, one of the things I, I'm writing about, you know, I would write about at this time here, the first thing that comes to my mind is scouting. Now, there are a lot of hunters who never scout. And a lot of them don't take the time because they think they really don't need to. Uh, put a few trail cams out there, get a picture of a big buck, and, whoa, this is the place to hunt the big buck. No, gee, well, what could be easier than that? This big buck walked on this trail or fed out here in this feeding area. What could be easier than that? Just Use trail cams to do the scouting. Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with that. <laughs> we, my boys and I have had a fair amount of experience with trail cams. We've got plenty of them in our group. And older style and newer styles. And uh, uh, it's still kind of exciting to see this big buck is my hunting area right now. Boy, I'd like to get this guy. But you know what always happens? I remember one year my son Dave, he had two trail, stands, uh, trail cams out on the end of a trail maybe a quarter mile long. And this trail was by, used by several big bucks living on a really high hill, big hill, uh, on the west end of that trail. Uh, we call it Acorn Mountain. And they were using that trail to go to a beaver pond on the other end to drink water, back and forth. That was, those trail cams were picking up deer doing that this time of the year. And so Dave was really excited about that. He thought, well, to manage different wind directions, I'll, I should have a tree stand on, on the east end of the trail, near the east end somewhere. And one, and one, or maybe two, depending on the wind direction, in either case, at the west end. And I'm ready. Seven mature bucks were using that trail. And he dedicated himself to hunting those trails. And uh, approach trails and approach from downwind directions. So you can always be approached from downwind or, or crosswind. You know, like one of those four tree stands. So I thought he had it made. He never saw one the entire hunting season. The whole season, even the last day. Four of those bucks were shot at sites up to a mile away by others in our hunting group, including me and John. So what that means is, you know, the trails and sites frequented by deer today can be vastly different than they are later on, like say, during a firearm hunting season or a bow hunting season. 
There's lots of reasons for that. You know, a deer can use a certain, certain trails to go to important places like bedding areas and, and currently favorite watering spots and current favorite feeding areas day after day after day. And then because of changes in wind direction, changes in foods that are available, uh, changes in the quality of cover, leaves falling, they start following in our area on the 22nd of September. Uh, that's when black ash leaves start falling. Uh, all kinds of things happen. Or they can change the use of favorite trails because they've discovered there's a hunter over here that uses this trail to get to a spot over there. He's a stand hunter. They understand stand hunting very well nowadays. And one that does that over there. So I can't use this trail anymore. And usually those changes because of hunting happen without the hunter even realizing until later on, I never saw a buck there. Obviously those bucks either knew he was there or for other reasons they just didn't use that trail anymore. So anyway, that's typical. Hunters, I get letters from hunters all the time. They send me pictures. What do you think of this big guy? Can't wait till the hunting season starts. Then after the hunting season, I get another email that says, maybe next year. <laughs> Pretty typical. Trail cams are wonderful in the way that they are now teaching people that there are big bucks living in their hunting. People used to say, oh, the buck to old, buck to doe ratio is just terrible. Here's one to nine, one to ten. That's not bad, one to nine. You know, there's only one, maybe two, trophy class bucks living in a suitable ha habitat of one square mile. Only two of them. Maybe only one. The big dominant breeding buck and maybe one of the other oldest bucks in the local pecking order. You can see a lot of doe animalist deer uh, and, and only see one of those deer once in a hunting season. It's like, well, it's just terrible. But it's normal. But most of the time, you know, most of those bucks that are three and a half years of age or older will live a normal life and die for reasons that have nothing to do with hunting. Because they are so good at finding and avoiding hunting hunters, stand hunters, including stand hunters, within their square mile home ranges. And once they find them, they know exactly what to do to stay away from them for the rest of the hunting season. That's normal. I, you know, people, I get bad letters from people when I say this, but there aren't any little buck to do home, uh, uh, ratios of bucks to do. No, no little buck to do uh, ratio. There aren't any. There's only a lot of hunters who don't know how to hunt big bucks. Oh yeah, well geez, these guys, I've been hunting 50 years, and I got all kinds of, I shot hundreds of bucks, you hear that story? I know, if I don't see them, they're not there. Guys will send me some nasty letters sometimes for saying that, but it's true. So, that's what I'm all about, teaching you how to hunt older bucks. So you start seeing them every year. It's, so you can take a mature buck every hunting season if you want. That's what I'm teaching you. Because it's fun. <laughs> it's the best of whitetail hunting. You don't have to complain anymore. You can learn how to hunt those bucks and see them. See deer, pecks, all the other hunters in this area they ever see. They're out there. So anyway. Hunters can't reduce their numbers. They're pretty stable from year to year to year. Okay, now back to business here, uh, scouting. Now, a lot of, I talked to you about why using trail cams is not a very productive way to find stand sites for hunting older bucks. Now, 
Another thing that hunters are doing now instead of scouting is, instead of scouting, it's, well, I'll use a lure of some kind to get the buck to come to wherever I want to hunt. You know, I, I like this tree and a really good field of the old year. I want to lure them right here. And so, hunters all over, millions of hunters all over America are doing this now, using lures of some kind. Uh, back in the middle 80s and early uh, uh, 1990s, boy, Dolan Estrus lure scent was dynamite. And the idea of being able to use lures really became solid back in those days. But it doesn't work anymore like that. But by, back in those same years, tree stands were being introduced. You know what? People didn't know anything about tree stands before that. Tree, tree stands were just fantastic for seeing all kinds of deer during the day. But even today, you know, our people in hunt where there's a lot of deer in farm areas, like say in Michigan, like southeast Michigan, uh, you can take a tree stand or you can fit on a portable blind on the ground somewhere and probably see 20, 30 deer a day out there that act as if they don't know you're there. One of the reasons they act that way is because they aren't worried about you. Uh, now, most of those deer, if any, are just, I mean most of those deer are animalist deer or young bucks like yearling bucks, spikes and forkies and such. And occasionally a two and a half year old buck. Maybe six, seven, eight pointer, sometimes even ten pointers. There was a small, only 14 inch spread on. Those kind of deer are still vulnerable to stand on. They still haven't learned everything they need to know to be able to identify you quickly and stay away from you. Any buck that's three and a half years of age or older knows everything <laughs> about that today, all over America. Because Millions of us have been doing this stuff for, for several decades now. And there's hardly a deer anywhere that hasn't learned, that doesn't be confronted with lures, like, like doe and estrus lure set, or, or dual call, or butt grunt call, or rattling antlers, or an electronic corn feeder, or a pile of corn in the woods, or a pile of apples in the woods, or a little plot of clover or turnips in the woods, or a um, um, or a salt block or a mineral block, stuff like that. Those are all lures, but they all result their use or overuse result in the same thing. Hunters who use those almost as a group I have two common complaints. One is the buck to doe ratio here is terrible and or something's got to be done to increase the number of big bucks in this area. Well, those aren't true. There's just as many bucks, big bucks, three and a half to six and a half years of age or older in the area, at least on first two or three days of hunting season when they're overwhelmed by people making drives and chasing them out of there into, into swamps and bogs and, you know, uh, cattail swamps and elder swamps and cedar swamps and spruce bogs and posted lands. Now, all those deer out in the woods in Michigan or other places like that, you see them, they don't even act like they're afraid. They walk by you and don't even look at you and well, it's kind of crazy. But there's not big, they aren't big bucks. The reason is that even in places like that, as well as in the woods where you've been hunting for a long time, um, those older bucks, by the time they're three and a half year old, they can spot the difference between a farmer they see every day working out in the fields, close range, or other people in the area that close range, parks and things. They, were, they can spot the difference between people like that and farmers and other people who are now hunting 
Hey, you can do that. There the guys sneaking in the woods, sneaking around with a gun, or making drives. I mean, a deer doesn't have to be brilliant to know that those people are hunting and they're dangerous. They also recognize the difference between a hunting season and other seasons. You know, all those things going on out in the woods, this is hunting season. Or even, look at there's a lot of people starting to move in the woods. They're living out here, walking all over the, these trails out in the woods. Hunting is about to begin. Good. Or they also recognize the difference between lands where hunting is legal and lands where hunting is, pro is prohibited. Farm areas, parks, refuges, places like that. Today, all a three and a half year old buck needs to know is those three things. You know? Uh, and they can live a normal life and die without, for reasons that have nothing to do with hunting. They're out there and they know what to do. And they're very quick at, discover, at discovering even the best hunters using tree stands with or without lures and avoiding them early in hunting seasons. And that's one of the problems we all have. And that's one of the things I've been dealing with for years in my studies, trying to learn how to identify mature buck effective stand sites. And the most important feature of those is very fresh tracks or droppings of a big buck within easy shooting distance uh, upwind or crosswind of your stand site. Now, so, knowing all that, one of the things that we started doing, you know, we could figure out what's, we, well, one of the things we found out, you know, think of this. We, in a 20 year period, we had only three stand sites that were effective on day one or two of a hunting season, five years in a row. They were kind of, this is rare compared to, all the stand sites we used in 20 years, pretty rare. Uh, some of them were effective a whole day or up to a day and a half, you know, consecutive half days of hunting. And some of them were uh, effective five days after being used the opening day. Go back there five days later, get a big buck. But every one had to be we learned it was senseless to hunt anywhere except within easy shooting distance down there across with a very fresh tracks or droppings made by a big buck. Otherwise you're wasting time. And the reason, there's a reason for that. Like say starting September or 15th they're out there bowling. Bucks don't just walk all over that square mile every day. They don't do that. They won't waste their time uh, taking the chances with hunters around. Most of their movements are limited to certain trails and areas in their hunting area. And those areas are bedding areas, watering sites, and feeding areas. Now they have lots of feeding areas. They have current favorite ones where they get like to go every day as long as possible. And some that but maybe the foods run out, like say maybe they're just eating green grasses there and clover in this feeding area. And now it's all drying up. And it says up where we hunt, uh, usually by the beginning of the second week in November, it's time to start eating browse. So now I want to go to this place because there's a lot of browse there that we like, especially those red osiers and sugar maple saplings and red things. But so now they're going to feed there. But they try to use certain trails, and these trails, they're connected over maybe a vast area of that square mile, you know, maybe a big circular area, but which only represents about 10% of that total square mile. They don't have any reason to go anywhere else except to check on those which are doing the same thing at feeding areas and water spots and, and, and 
bedding areas during that same period. So they, they're using those certain trails. And we learned long ago that if you're not, that's where, you know, those places are plainly marked in the woods by very fresh tracks and droppings of big bucks and other deer. When I say tracks of big bucks, I'm talking about tracks of mature bucks that are three and three eighths inch in length, which is typical for two and a half year old buck. Three and five is up to four inches for the really big guys, like the big dominant breeding bucks, like the four inches, the track measurement only. And their droppings, like for two and a half year old buck, are uh, typically five eighths inches. Anything smaller is a doe or yearling or fawn, but five eighths inches for two and a half year old bucks and three quarters to one inch and a little bit more for the big bucks, the big, the kind you'd probably want to put on the wall. A one inch droppings, oh my, that's, you get the buck that's making those, you're gonna, you're gonna put them on the wall, that's a big one. That's what we're looking for. And they're only in 10% of the area today. That doesn't mean three days from now, they're in a different 10% area. And the only way you can be consistent, your chance to keep your odds at high for taking a mature buck is always be close to those fresh tracks and droppings, wherever they are, in that square mile. Now, other bucks in this square mile be different 10% areas, and one over there, different percent. You see how that works? But if you want to take big bucks, you're wasting your time somewhere else. And if you're kind of sloppy about your scan hunting, they aren't going to be in this, they probably won't be in this 10% area anymore tomorrow or the next day. So, anyway. Uh, now, so that tells you how you should scout. You know, when you go out there scouting early in September, like I said, September 1st, geez, all the plants are this tall and full of leaves, and it's really hard to find traction droppings of deer, first traction. But you gotta look for them, you get out there. Now if you've been doing this for a lot of years like us, I know probably a dozen places where I can walk to today in my in my steady hunting area where I'm gonna find tracks of mature bucks. That I so I have this advantage because I've got a lot of experience about this. Because the best spots in East Square Mile are adopted by the biggest bucks every year, because they're the best spots, that are the most secure, the most secure trails, the best foods, best, most secure bedding, those kind of things. So I know where to go look for them. So you will too after you've done this for a while. But anyway, so it isn't like I have to find pages and pages of wonderful deer signs out in the woods. At that time of year, you're not going to find any fresh handle runs of golf scratch. That one doesn't start out until mid-October. I think about the first month of that archery season. So just don't worry about this. You go out there, wander around, and at this time of the year, go ahead and wander, and you might alarm some deer in the process. But if you're kind of noisy and doing it and talking about it, they'll hear you coming and move out of the way, and for that reason, they won't be really alarmed. If you catch them by surprise up close, you might alarm them. So it's better to be a little bit noisy when you're scouting this time of year. Then they won't run away. They won't, won't abandon their ranges. So what you're looking for is trails. Now, all trails in the woods lead to feeding areas. They funnel down to trails that, that where deer go out into the feeding areas to feed. And feeding areas to bend, tend to be kind of open overhead except uh, groves of of the oaks that produce acorns. They, they'll be all shady underneath, but that's another kind of feeding area. But anyway, uh, but any, you, you have to learn, well, oh, these are kind of characteristics of, of feeding areas, but I've had hundreds of hunters uh, come to my hunting school, buck hunting schools, up in the wilds of northern Minnesota for years and years and years. And there wasn't a one of them not one of them that recognized when they were in a feeding area, when there's a lot of leaves and trees 
you know, a lot of trees with colored leaves in there. It, it, not, it wasn't until I stopped and started showing them, this is what I'm feeding her. These are the foods they're eating this time of the year, whatever it is. And look at the tracks, off-trail tracks and droppings. All of your, there are more tr deer tracks and droppings in a feeding area than anywhere in the woods. And when you get in a place down and you start looking at the ground, well, look at all these, there's tracks. And if some of them are fresh, you know, clearly defined them down soft soil. And holy cow, there's buck tracks like that out there. That's an exciting find for bull hunting in September. And I'll tell you why. You know, when bucks shed valid about the first of September, from that time on they're free to wander all through their hunting area, their their home range. But you know, like I say, they don't waste time in areas they don't need to go visit, except maybe to visit those now and then, find out who's living in their ranges. They haven't been able to do that for a while. And uh, but those are not going to be in heat in there until November. And yeah, we we'll, we might argue about that, but we'll talk more about that in another seminar. But anyway, uh, so what they're mostly interested in now after shedding velvet is getting together with other bucks to spar or battle with their antlers and gains to determine or to gain the highest position possible in that square mile buck pecking order. And the one who beats them all is becomes the dominant breeding buck for the following year. He's the boss buck from then on. And they have to reestablish that every year. They can't wait to do that after they've shed their velvet on their new antlers. Even little yearlings, they get involved. Oh, they want to fight with it. Even the biggest buck in the area there, our friend, I want to go over here and clash antlers with you. So they do this late in feeding cycle. This goes on for a whole month in your hunting area from uh, mid-September when you can start hunting till mid-October. So the very best place to hunt that bucks, mature bucks, in September is at a feeding area. That is the current favor of all these bucks for feeding. That's the one they want to be in. And that will be full of different sized buck tracks from three and five inches to four inches and droppings from five inches to an inch. And usually the buck droppings are become clumps at this time, but they're, gee, inch long drop. That's a big one in here, you know. So that's what you're looking for. And you want to find a few places, not just one place at a feeding area or a food plot, if that's what you're wanting to do, although you could, that'll lose its uh, mature buck effectiveness very quick. A lot of times they lose their effectiveness even before the season begins. Same with people using those trail cams. Boy, they got this new flu bottle. Now they can't wait to see bucks out there. I mean, you cameras out there and put them in trees and on these trails. And gee, they get a picture and oh gee, that's great. Uh, they'll take the card out. Well, they can't see it, they take the card out. Now you can read them, something you can read out there in the woods, but you take the car off, put a new one in there, put it in the pot, you can't wait, and you can't wait to get home, put it in the computer and see what you got. And uh, same way with the food plots that people are, all these other lures that they're using. They, you know, they got this moth scrape and all kinds of things out there. Can't wait to get out there and see if it's attracting a buck or big bucks. Oh boy, it's getting excited. Oh yeah, look at here, you got a picture of this huge one. He's eating clover in my food pot. See, I was out there spring and cleaning at him, plowing and all that work. Really paying off. Look at the size of this thing. Every time you go out there, you're laying trail scent. If you didn't know about trail scent, you know, trail scent is made up of odiferous molecules being emitted by your body and your clothing and your hunting gear wherever you go in the woods. And wherever it falls on the ground, or it comes from your boots, 
and sold your boots as well. They are rubber uh, or leather. White tails can smell that odor, those odors, up to four days. The trail scent lasts about four days, sometimes longer. But these guys with their trail cams and their flute pots, oh, I'm going to go out there again tomorrow. Get change cards again. Look at that. I got this nice bike. I'm going to see if there's any others here. They keep going out there. And every time you go out there, you re re restore the original strong odors of your trail scent or even make them more intense, putting more on top of each other every day or every other day. Now, there's hardly a buck in America today that doesn't readily recognize construction or destruction or intense trail sense in the woods made by humans because they have learned Wherever those things are found, it's dangerous. It's okay. So you go out there, you make your food plot, or put a tree stand up. You do all this work, you wander all over the place, you've done all this work to create the clover or the, or the, the root crops or whatever you put in there, things with, with protein, <laughs> which are, seem to be the rage nowadays. I think it's foolishness myself. But anyway, uh, you've been putting trail scent out there like you wouldn't believe, and you just never thought of that. Holy cow, what you're doing, you're poisoning it. You know, ironically, the more you do around a stand site where you think you're going to get a big buck, the, the more it'll work as a repellent to keep big bucks away. Simple as that. And it's the reason you can been doing this for years now. And geez, I got even nine of them out there, or some of them told me. And I'm really good at this. Nine different food plants I'm using as bait sites. Really have to do that is because they aren't seeing big bucks at at eight or nine or eight, seven or eight or more. Maybe the first year when they make one might see one then. That's your probably your best time to get one. But after that, very unlikely. So Trail scent is very important. You have to consider that. When you find a stand site, and let's say it's on a trail, and this goes on in this feeding area, and there's all kinds of buck tracks out there made by mature bucks. That size. Pick your stand site. Keep it back in the woods a little ways. Ten yards at least if you're a bull hunter. Not on the edge. If you're on the edge, you're a sitting duck for bucks that recognize like I said, construction, destruction, or intense trail scents that are characteristic of human uh, stand sites nowadays. That's terrible. If it's back in the woods a little bit with natural cover in front of it, maybe a little natural shooting line, not one you made, and or natural shooting windows, holes through cover to the feeding area right over there. Uh, you're, not only will your your stand site be mature buck effective longer, over a longer period, and, and, and though you might not like the fact that you can't see this whole feeding area while you're sitting there, you're going to get a lot more, very, a lot more close range shots at big unsuspecting bucks than you ever would when you're sitting right on the edge. Don't be on the edge. Get back in the way. I don't care how think how good you think you are or how good your your blind that you're using this portable line. Um, you aren't that good. You not. And the more time you spend there, so what we do, see we find a good stance and boy, this looks good, you know, there's a trail just full of tracks of this big buck. And, and maybe later in the year when we're scouting for rifle hunting, well, look at here's big and look at this big ground scraper, things like that, beds. Uh, oh yeah, this is a good spot, good cover uh, for sitting on a stool, or maybe for opening. I think see this tree with all these big evergreens around. Boy, oh, that'll be a great place to sit. They won't see you up there. You're so that'll be really hidden here. Well, that's let's set this up quick. 
just get it done and get the heck out of here as quickly as possible. And then don't go back for two weeks for any reason. Uh, put your trail cams anywhere else, but you've found enough to practically guarantee that you can get a big buck at a place like The spots where I've gotten most of my biggest bucks have always been at places like that. And they said, this is where I'm going to sit. I'm going to put my stool right here. I'll just stamp down the grass here a little bit behind this, this spruce tree right here. <laughs> Give me a good cover from that trail where that buck is. Yeah, that kind of thing. Okay, that's all I need to do. Stamp this down. Well, on the way out of here, we'll put some fluorescent tacks on trees so I can find my way here in the dark opening morning. And I'm all set. Get out of here. Don't go back. Don't keep putting out, going to trail cans or out there to look for tracks in your food plots or whatever you do. Get, stay away from there. No, you don't need any doe and estrus lure set for this. Uh, you, you just will running, you go out there open the morning and you're putting all these containers with doe and estrus lure set out there and you're walking all over the trail, trails that the buck is going to use. Put trail set all over the place. Uh, you're poisoning that area. He might come there during the night and holy cow, there's, <laughs> there's all kinds of fresh trail scent around here. This is a dangerous place. I gotta stay from. Big bucks know that. You know, those three things I tell you, all I have to know know to live a long life while well, they're all there. You're letting them know. Or another thing, don't go there on the day TV. <laughs> For heaven's sake, ATVs are stinky, they make a lot of noise, they announce the deer nowadays, here comes a hunter, and they announce the deer. The hunter's still there because that engine hasn't started again and went away. He's over there. And he smells like that ATV. He's got exhaust fumes on him, oil fumes on him, uh, gas fumes on him, and uh, Boy, it's sure easy to identify by, stand, by by airborne scent or trail scents now after he's been riding that thing. It might have been okay years ago, you know, like you used to be able to drive along the road and there's all these deer feeding there and they don't pay attention to them. We don't see many of them doing that now. When you stop, boom, away they go. That's the way they do it nowadays. Well, same way with the ATVs today. Uh, if you need it to haul a deer, that's fine, but don't make a trail all the way to your stand site in order to haul a deer away. That's so bad, especially when you want to take a big buck. You might take lots of yearlings and does, young, young does that way, but not big bucks. So that's part of your problem if, if you aren't seeing big bucks. Okay, so scouting. Scouting for that first month of an archer season is easy. Even though you don't see a lot of signs just walking around the woods and casually looking for them. But look for feeding areas with lots of tracks and droppings or trails that, that enter feeding areas. That's your stand site. And don't depend on one because those big bucks are very good at finding because that's where you, you know, you just put a stand site where a buck is spending a lot of his time. This is 10% area. This is a place where he's going to come tomorrow morning or later today for sure. But if you got it all messed up with trail scent and all kinds of other obvious changes, well, you may never see a buck there because they're good at, at, at identifying these things safe distance away and big bucks that no, you don't know they're there, you're not acting like you know they're there, they prefer to sneak away very quietly and then stay away from it for the rest of the hunting season. So keep that in mind. Okay, now sir, if you're a serious bow hunter, you know an incredible lot of new things that will make it possible for you to become regularly successful at taking big bucks during early archery season. Keep that in mind. Don't cheat on it. I know it's awkward to do the things I recommend at first, but they work. And I can prove it. Well, I hate to brag, but 
by doing things like this, my three sons and I have taken 101 bucks since 1990. Mature buck. So, how many people do you know who have done that? <laughs> I'd wager nobody. Even guys spent a lot of money to pay really good guys that were on a fence land. So that's pretty unusual, buck hunting. And you can do it too. And you'll find out. Those big bucks you think aren't there, you're going to start seeing them doing things like this. So, well, I ought to mention too that, you know, I've had guys say, well, you must hunt on private land or fence land. No, I have never hunted on private land, ever. No farms, no ranches out west, none of those things. We have always hunted on public land uh, and uh, unfenced land. Uh, a lot of guys seem to think that that's the hardest kind of hunting that is. Well, it is. But we hunt in that deep wilderness area. I sent a letter to a guy yesterday, and he was talking about uh, he hasn't found tracks or droppings in this hunting area recently while he was counting. Bigger than uh, the tracks, nothing bigger than uh, three and three eighths. Or droppings, five eighths inches which is two and a half year old bucks. Well, I wrote back to him, well, at this time of year, you should almost expect that because all those bigger bucks are still growing antlers. And they're spending almost all of their time, especially in wolf country like where we are, uh, in their little secluded highway, hideaways and they hardly ever leave there. They feed there and bed there and water is almost always within a hundred yards. So you aren't going to find signs everywhere of bucks like that this time of the year. Well, even even when you go out there in September, by the time in September first, they're they're regularly traveling in those ten percent areas. Then you start finding them. So I said, be patient about that. Then I mentioned too, you know, if your hunting area is bounded on one side by a, a, a often traveled road. You know, well, that could be a problem sometimes because we've learned that, you know, poachers, which there are a lot of them there, and road hunters and grouse hunters and uh, uh, other people uh, might hunt that area for one reason or another because it's close to the road. But if no part of your hunting area is any closer than a half mile of that road, you'll pretty much have it to yourself from now on. And you're going to be happy with what you find with deer signs because you'll have a full complement of tracks made by older bucks in an area like that. In the other area, they might be there at times, like especially when their does are in heat, but Come, uh, probably only visited at night because this is frequented by other hunters, you know. So get a half, get a little deeper in the area where you're hunting, and you'll be all right. Okay. Well, just reiterate a couple other tips or precautions. We, you know, our last counting is always done two weeks early. The reason that is, if you screw up somewhere along the line, and usually it happens while you're even knowing it, after two weeks of not being bothered by anyone, all those bucks will be back in their ranges doing normal predictable things in normal predictable places during normal predictable hours. If you do this the day or two before the hunting scene, you might have you know, it may never happen because once they know you're there, for sure, you know, they smell all these scents and everything, uh, uh, they may stay away the rest of the hunting scene from your stand signs that you work so hard to make. So keep that in mind. So, anyway, uh, two weeks. It sounds like something, you, gee, how do you live through that two weeks when you look at this picture, this big mark on your, on your picture, trail cam picture? But damn, you don't need to know any more than that from your trail cam, okay? And chances are, if those four-inch tracks that you're keying on 
were made by that book, you're going to get that book. But you keep going out there. You're not going to get that big book. You'll be sending me a mail, an email saying, maybe next year, that kind of thing. So, now, one other thing, you know, my newest book has got 20 years of research that I never wrote about in any previous book. I mean, this thing is so old, and it's, I'm sure it's my last gear book. And uh, what I'd advise you to do, really, would, there's so much more to learn than I haven't touched in all of these seminars I've been providing yet. And probably, or there's no way I could get it all in there before the next year I don't see any. But, you know, I've been writing Whitetail Hunter's Almanacs since 1988, a long time ago. This is the 10th edition, and I know how this works. <clears throat> People get them, and they really like them. They love these books. My little ones that sold for $9.95, they were so popular. Well, this one has got as much information as 20 of those little ones could provide. So this is kind of a book that you're going to want to bone up on all this other information before every hunting season. This year, get it, go through it, learn all these. There's awful little things in there, little things in boxes that say to hunt like Dr. Ken and that kind of stuff in there. Uh, or two, but so you'll find them in there. I mean, where you should be at a feeding area and this wind direction and that, things like that. But anyway, you want this to bone up on all this added information this year, and once you do, I know, absolutely know, you're going to look at it every year, go through it every year before every succeeding hunting season. Because you can't possibly learn everything that's in here and use it in this year. There's going to be more. Next year you want to try this hunting method. There's six new hunting methods, ten other methods, that all work to varying degrees. So, oh, this, next year i got to try this one. Because you found something that you learn, well, oh, if you find a buck driving his track from, driving his hoofs from track to track in the snow, it means this, and this is where you should hunt them. And we've done so well doing that. <laughs> You'll find that in here. So, <clears throat> no, you're gonna you're gonna really like this book for the rest of your life, and you'll ruin it. You'll be uh, putting color markings all over it, and adding tabs to pages and dog ears, and it'll get dirty. And you'll take it to deer camp, and might even get some deer blood and some pages, things like that. But you're going to want this book the rest of your life. <laughs> so, really, uh, that's not just something that make you buy a book. I, I, I just want you to learn all the good things, all the things I've learned in the time I have left, you know. And uh, so you can use these the rest of your life. Maybe you're just 18 years old. <laughs> yeah, I wish I was 18 again. So I and knew all the things I knew now when I was 18. Jeez, what a difference that would have made. So anyway, uh, do that. Uh, get your book, you know, and when, and when you learn what what you learn, share it with your hunting deer hunting partners and deer hunting friends, and maybe someday then. All of us, you and I, and all of us, all of us deer hunters in America, will often take mature bucks. And, uh, you know, mature bucks are those, most of them, 90% of them, are those non breeding princes, you know, they're like a prince of the whitetail world, that have been wasted, unknowingly wasted, by a whitetail hunter for centuries. And, Time would quit wasting those deer, you know? Now, I'd like to remind you, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I really appreciate it. And this way you always get messages on your, on your computer when I've, when I've created a new YouTube presentation like right now. 
And also, when you do that, uh, if you like what you've found, give me a thumbs up. You know, that's easy. Just poke the button there with the thumb up. <laughs> I appreciate that. And all you guys, always give me a thumbs up if you like it, really. If you don't like it, even press the thumbs down. There's a few of those who don't want to agree with what I have to say, and I expect that. I can't please 15 million deer hunters, all of them. But anyway, especially if they've never tried what I teach, but that changes. <laughs> but anyway, do that. Uh, subscribe and poke that thumbs up button for me, will you? I'd really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. It means it gives me more incentive. You know, I've got, right now I've got over 5.4 million minutes of white hunters watching my, my, uh, my YouTube seminars. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> but as you know, what I teach is, is good sense and it's logical and it works. So thanks again for watching me and I'll see you again soon. Bye now. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries. And be sure to sign up for my email updates. Here you will also find deer and bear hunting articles, my website bookstore, and much more.